Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. Welcome to this episode of The How of Business. This is Henry Lopez. My guest today is Amy Rasdahl. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Now, Amy's going to share her interesting entrepreneurial journey, her successful transition from a successful corporate career to starting her own consulting business. And that's what we're going to do a deeper dive in. She's got a lot of knowledge and helps people with starting and growing a successful consulting business. You want to receive more information about the How of Business, including the show notes page for this episode. There's um, some free downloads that you'll want to get. So be sure you go to the show notes page for this episode. And also, if you want to continue supporting my show and receive exclusive content and discounts through a Patreon membership, you can get all of that at thehowofbusiness.com. I also encourage you to subscribe wherever you're listening to this episode so you don't miss any new episodes. So Amy Rasdahl, uh, she uh, traded her corporate job, as I mentioned, for consulting about 15 years ago and now makes more than most executives. She uh, takes advantage of the freedoms, the flexibility, the control, and the interesting work, and of course, excellent pay that her business affords her. She has been running her own multiple six-figure consulting business for more than 15 years. And as the founder of Billable at the Beach, that's the name of her business, Billable at the Beach, Amy has helped hundreds of people start their own successful consulting business through speaking, workshops, and various programs over the past 10 years. Billable at the Beach liberates six-figure earners by empowering them to build six-figure consulting businesses. She's the author of the book, Land the Consulting Project Now, Build a Life of Freedom, Flexibility, and Inspiring Work, Running Your Own Six-Figure Business, which has been a number one bestseller in business consulting category, as well as seven other categories on Amazon. Amy lives in the San Diego, California area. Once again, Amy Rasdahl, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Henry. Yeah, looking forward to this conversation. This is often uh, you know, a common a business idea that people have, especially as they're looking to leverage the expertise that they've accumulated, but now go offer that expertise on their own. But before we go there, I always like to understand the journey, and especially since you did, like myself, trans transition from a successful corporate career to starting your own business. So tell me that early story briefly about your career after university. Sure. So I'm going to actually start just a touch before that, because I think it's relevant. I am a Silicon kid. My dad was an early Silicon Valley semiconductor guy. Was that right? So I grew up, I did, I didn't realize this, of course, as a teenager growing up, but later on, it became clear to me that this had a huge impact on my future career. I grew up in Silicon Valley. My dad actually moved us there from the Los Angeles area. And when he moved us there, Silicon Valley, which is now mostly pavement and skyscrapers, <laughs> big corporate campuses for Apple and Google and Facebook, these giant, beautiful camp corporate campuses, was mostly agricultural. Yeah, it was all farmlands, and right? It was farmland, um, a lot of fruit trees, fruit orchards. And we thought, what kind of boony, like, is our dad becoming a farmer? Um, where is he moving us? <laughs> and, what, what company did he go work for? Do you recall? It was a company called Avantech. Okay. Way back in the day. And um, I didn't realize at the time, but so all of those dinner tables that I sat around my own and you'd have dinner with friends and all that kind of stuff, kind of everybody's dad was doing a technology startup of some type or another. And it was the dads in those days. I didn't come across any moms who were doing it. So we were just sitting around soaking up dinner table conversation or when they were watching our games or us riding bikes or playing in the pool or whatever it might be, I didn't really realize how much I was learning and how much that was shaping because it never occurred to me in those early days 
I thought everyone did technology startups. I see. So it didn't really occur to me that anybody did anything else, right? I didn't know about brand management and consumer products and all that kind of stuff because that's what everybody was doing. So I started out as a software engineer. An odd slight detour there is that I loved being an undergrad. So I also have degrees in um, music and French. I had wow. a music scholarship that paid for my undergraduate education. And just this morning, I was listening to the episode you did with the CFO, who oddly enough also started out as a music major. So right. I thought that was that was a, a funny coincidence that she also did. And I also knew that that wasn't going to be the way that I wanted to support myself. Um, so I wrote code for a few years back in Silicon Valley, and then I went to business school. So in those days, uh, the internet was not a thing yet. And I ended up going to business school on the East Coast at a you know fancy Ivy League school. It was a great experience, but... I was a California, Silicon Valley, public school, public college kid. And boy, it was a shock <laughs> to go to an Ivy League school. I had gone to school in France for a year as an undergraduate. I attended a French university speaking, doing everything in French. I felt more like I was a foreign country going to an Ivy League school than I did going to a French university. Well, what was what was if you could share at least you know in summary what what was it that was so shockingly different? My classmates, just the their people. perspectives, their uh, where they came from, yes, their thoughts on life. It was just a very different world. I didn't know anything about prep schools. Uh, my husband and I. My husband went with me. We weren't married yet, and so we went to this little barbecue you know, before school started. And on the way home, he says, did you catch Peter's last name? And I said, well, Rockefeller, <laughs> Rockefeller, but I'm sure there's other Rockefellers. Right. And he said, he said, Amy, that's a Rockefeller. And that's sure the, enough, the Rockefeller. <laughs> and it was just, it was so surreal for me because I was a California technology, uh, you know, public school kids. So it was, it was very interesting, a whole yeah. world that I had no idea existed. Now, let me ask you those, those influences though, that you were grew, that you grew up around, were they still though about being an employee in these firms or did you also get influenced by, no, you need to be the owner? Oh no, for sure. The people that I grew up around were were found, what I would refer to as founders. Okay. So my long term career goal from the beginning was to be a startup CEO. Okay. So I did the technical piece. Then I went to business school, and I set about systematically building my experience, um, trying to work my way through all of the cross functional areas. So I started out really big corporate out of business school. I was lucky enough to work for a subsidiary of Eli Lilly, big pharma company. So they had amazing opportunities, kind of management training programs, if you will, where every year you could pick whatever functional area you wanted to try. Mm -hmm. So when you consider my goal of being a startup CEO, that was perfect. Yeah. So great I, training I, ground. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I worked in, mar the first thing I did was marketing because I had been an engineer. So I wanted to try what I viewed as the, the other side or perhaps <laughs> even the dark the evil side. side yes. <laughs> exactly. And it was so funny too, because I remember one of my early, uh, you know, departmental meetings, somebody's pounding on the table and saying, those engineers, they don't know, blah, blah, blah. And I had been sitting around the engineering table a couple of years earlier. Those marketing people, mm. they don't, you know, <laughs> so it was so funny. But what it did, Henry, is it gave me a very unique skill set in being able to bridge that gap, having deep experience in research and development, product development, engineering, also deep experience in marketing. Yeah. to really understand where both sides were coming from. Because by definition, you're sometimes opposed, right? The marketing people always want more features, bells and whistles. The engineering people are trying to meet budgets and 
delivery schedules and all that kind of stuff. So you're kind of at cross purposes. It's, it's not a big surprise. Um, so I went about, you know, systematically building my cross-functional experience first in a medical device subsidiary of Eli Lilly, um, a few other bigger companies got a little bit smaller. Eventually I jumped off and did my first venture funded startup. I was the third employee of a venture funded startup. Um, I, see. I was back on a marketing track there. I kind of, my two deepest functional areas are marketing and R and D product development. So I kind of jumped back and forth between those two areas. I have very, very strong skills in project management. Um, in on the R and D side, I eventually went uh, worked my way into being a program director. So running large product development teams, cross functional budgets as much as twenty million dollars, sixty, seventy, eighty people on the team, um, some pretty big scope. And I jumped off and then I learned the whole world, started to learn the whole world of startups being an early stage. I wasn't a founder, but I was the third person. Mm -hmm. uh, what does venture funding look like? What does fundraising look like? What is, what's it like to have board meetings with um, people whose job it is to mercilessly grill you, <laughs> you know, right. making sure that, that all of their investors money is going to be safe with this team. And Henry, I learned so much. My next startup, that so that one was venture fund, and my next startup was Bootstrapped. Okay. So that was a whole. That's not the business you have now. Is in prior to this? Or no, that, no, no. Okay. This was still bigger. And there, here's what I learned there, and I think this is really relevant for um, the smaller, smaller business folks who are with us today. Cash is king, mm -hmm. you know it made me really learn how to understand cash. Yeah. Um, well, it's the number and, one thing that kills small businesses is running out of cash as, as simple as that sounds. Yeah. Yes. And, and I don't, you know, I had been in big companies. I'd had venture funding where we had um, some reasonably deep pockets behind us. Right. And this, this company we were bootstrapping. Yeah. And, I feel like I was there for 18 months. We did eventually crash and burn, which has a whole nother set of learnings. <laughs> sure. But I was there, I was there for about 18 months, and I feel like I got five or six years worth of business experience in 18 months because there were times when I was sitting in my office that, you know, had all the the glass looking out at a sea of 60 people who were working for us. I was part of the executive team. And at one point it was Wednesday and I had no idea how we were going to pay those people on Friday. Friday yeah. was payday and uh, we had nothing in the bank. Wow. So that's, there's that's that. the pressure of being, you know, in that, in that level of position of responsibility or as a business owner, right? I mean, that's, that's the stress and pressure that comes with it. And nothing sears things into your, your memory and your instincts better than something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you how long, how long were you working for someone else before you started these ventures? How, how long of a period of time was that in the corporate world? About 15 years, including okay. my, um, my bench engineering days. Would you, when you look back at it now, would you have jumped sooner or was that what you needed before you felt you were ready to do your own thing. I really feel like that was perfect. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it except for, you know, I had that one boss. I could have left him sooner, <laughs> but so, no, but you know, we, and, we learn even from that. We oh learn, boy. don't we? Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. Per perhaps more. Agreed. Agreed. Um, um, so no, I, I wouldn't change that, Henry. Okay. I think that that ex that really deep experience has served me amazingly well. As has I was willing to go to business school. As a technical person, I wanted to make the jump out of being an engineer in ultimately into management, and I was willing to go to business school really just for the pedigree, but. All these years later, and I'm not going to say how many years it's been, <laughs> a, a long, you know, couple of decades. It's been a bit. 
Um, I still use what I learned in business school turned out to be very practical and yeah. I still use those things. Well, that's good to hear. You know, I think that as we'll get into just to, to jump ahead for a little bit, what I often find what happens to people that go from being, you know, a technician or a specialist to then starting their own consulting business is they're very good at the engineering part of it, the delivery part of it but they often forget about running the business and the marketing and sales side of the business, oh. right? So that gave you, and going back to your experience on that side of it, that gave you that balance to understand that. Is that fair? Oh, and I think the point you bring up is so important. So in, in what I do now, which is helping people start their own consulting businesses, I tell people, and this might be a little bit shocking, when I'm actually doing the billable work, that's almost like a vacation. Mm. And that might sound really weird because you're thinking, wait, isn't that the work? The hard part, the hard part, and this, I think this is universal, Henry, even for the people who have spent their whole career in sales, the networking, marketing, and business development, which are all terms or words for selling. And we feel a little uncomfortable with talking about selling, of course. but that's really what it boils down to. And I think for consulting, that's true. I think that's true for any business. Agreed. Agreed. And, and again, as, a, as the technician, uh, you know, using that word generally, or as Michael Gerber uses it in the e-myth as that technician, of course you, this, that's the easy part, the delivery. It's what you do. It's what you're good at. Right. And that's what yes. you know, and we can hide in there. Uh, yes. And then the next thing we know, we have no pipeline of new business. Yeah. Exactly. So, and but let's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to cut you off. No, there, no, go ahead. Yes. Let's, let's dive, let's start dive into it. But I thought where we would start on the consulting business is what do we mean by a consulting business? There's all kinds of different consulting businesses. Yes. Generally speaking, what, what types of consulting businesses do you focus on? Yes. So thank you. There are. And so just know that this is my working definition of what consulting is at the core for me, a consultant is a superhero with superpowers making super pay. You go in with your key expertise and what I encourage people to look for when they're determining their key expertise, it's what you're really good at. So if you can find the intersection of what you're really good at and love to do, what you're good at, what you really love to do, what lights you up, and what the market will pay for. Right. So if you can find that sweet spot where those th three things intersect, that's your superhero and your superpower, right? And I got to think, Amy, I, we got to look for then, is it to the, to the part, will you, will you get paid well? What is that service, that expertise that you can bring to bear for another organization that they likely don't have on staff or don't want to develop on staff and are willing to pay you to bring that expertise to them. Is that is that a fair way that's, to look at it as well? That's exactly. And so in my world of consulting, it's your job to get in there and solve the problem, the project, the crisis, the skill set that they don't currently have that they need. You get in and then you get out. You're not staying there. You are not making yourself indispensable to the day-to-day -day operations of the company. So in my world, it's not fractional. It's superhero, superpower, super pay. Yeah. Which is which is a little, fractional is very popular right now. Right. Um, in my world of consulting, uh, it works for a lot of people and specific categories of people who do consulting, it works particularly well. And again, I already mentioned that I listened to your CFO episode. And so it lends itself well on CFO, but right. it's not what, what I try to do. I try to go in and focus and then get out. Get yeah, you complete a out. project for them or help them with a project or a particular area of pain. And then you go on to the next thing. Yeah. But it's an interesting point, Amy, because it also, we have to think about, does that appeal to me? Because some people I have found who have gone into consulting, they miss the um, 
showing up at the same place uh, consistently, developing those relationships. I'm the reverse. I loved uh, when I did some consulting and also similarly sales, I loved being able to move on to the next challenge. That's what I loved about it. Yeah. You love being able to move on. So yep. I think this is a really important point for us to make, Henry, is that um, the consultant's death knell is if you want to go to the same place with the same team every day, then you should you should get a job. You should be an employee. And I think you've said you loved your days as an employee. I did too. I had great experiences. And if if that's where you decide to stay and you love it, that's what you should do. But here's the problem. I and I see this over and over again. It's a really big mistake. Uh, people who start their own business, they go into consulting. We feel a little uncomfortable with having our own business, right? Where the pipeline is all up to us. And there's mm -hmm. a part of us that's going to always be seeking stability, right? Sort of like a heat seeking missile. It's going to be looking <laughs> for stability. And we need to be careful of that because if you take on a project and all of a sudden you're giving one client all of your hours you're showing up every day, you're becoming part of an indispensable part of the day-to-day -day operations, what's going to happen? They're going to offer you a job. Of course, because that's, you know, it's going to be make better sense for them financially, probably. Right. And Nothing they, they, they want to keep you, they, they want to be able to lock you up a little bit more than for you to be easily course. walk away. Yeah. Nothing ends a great relationship faster than a job offer. Interesting. So if I allow that to happen, and I actually have specific strategies in place to prevent job offers, which sounds crazy to some of some of yeah, our it, listeners, it does sound today. crazy because I would I would think that's a that would I would take that as a compliment on the work that I've done. But to explain, let's dive into that a little bit. Why do I want to avoid that? You want to avoid that because if they offer you a job. If they propose to you and you turn them down, the relationship is over. Okay. Okay. Uh, instead, what I want to do is nurture and manage that relationship such that I'll do another project for them next year or whenever. A hundred percent. Okay. But right. superhero, superpower, super pay, get in. Now get in and get out. That's probably nine to 18 months. Sure, so I'm not sure, talking sure. about a few weeks. It's still a long time. And then a few years later, they call you again. Right. And in those intervening few years, they they tell their colleagues. They refer you, yeah. You know, they bump into somebody picking up lunch or at an, at an industry networking event, and they somebody shares a problem. They say, ah, you got to call Amy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Or they move on to another uh, corporation, and they know Amy's the person to call, yeah. Exactly, Okay, the book again is called Land a Con a Consulting Project Now. And so one of the things that you share in there obviously is what you call these four things you need to get started. So what what are a couple of those four things that are critical to getting started in your experience? Sure. So everyone thinks starting a business is this big overwhelming thing. And I like to make it so it's not. And I've talked about my background. I worked big corporate. I worked startups, venture funded startups, bootstrapped. But when I went to start my own solopreneur independent consulting business, I didn't really know because when we were leasing buildings and had 60 people and there was a lot of administrative stuff. Right. So when I started this, I didn't, I knew there was stuff, but I didn't know if it was a huge mountain or a little tiny hill. And I'm here to tell you that it's a little tiny hill. So I want people to focus on two things, land a project, get a check in the bank. To get started, you don't need a website. You don't need to name your business. You don't need a storefront. Here's what you need. Brain power, business experience, a computer, and a phone. 
even my 12 year old, who's now <laughs> second year of college, she's not 12 anymore. She's 19. I was going to say, that's quite a brilliant 12 year old. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry. But we, we think of them as 12 years old, right? Yeah. Yeah. By the time she was 12 and she was actually later than a lot of her friends, she had a cell phone. So it's pretty accessible these days, especially since the pandemic to have a phone and a computer. And that's really all you need, Henry. Yeah. You don't need. And what I want you to do, if you're interested in doing consulting, I want you to focus, laser focus, land a project, get a check in the bank, because until you have revenue coming in, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not a business. It's not a business, right? yeah, yeah. The point of having a business is to make money and none of us should ever feel badly about that. We're all serving our clients. And I and I completely believe that all of us have these gifts and talents, and we really owe it to the world to get them out there, keeping them hidden inside. It, that doesn't serve anybody. Yeah. And when we're serving our clients, they want to pay us. So once you have revenue coming in, the level of confidence, that first check that you put in the bank, your confidence will explode. Yeah. And there's something about the money coming. There's something about money attracts money. It, it just seems to work that way. Okay. Right? This is Henry Lopez briefly pausing this episode to invite you to join me for one of my next live online workshops. During these interactive workshops, I cover a specific topic that will help you with starting and growing your small business. Just visit thehowofbusiness.com to learn more and to register. If you need help creating an effective business plan, for example, to start your first small business, then my next business plan workshop may be just what you need. Or perhaps you need help completing your financial projections for your new business. Well, I have a workshop for that too. And if you're already operating your business, then you can probably benefit from learning how to better manage the cash in your business by attending my cash flow management online workshop. These are just a few of the workshops that I currently offer, and I keep these workshops to a small number of participants so that we have the time to answer all of your questions. Whether it's getting started with your first business or growing and exiting your existing small business, I can help you get there with one of my online workshops. To find out more and to register for a live online workshop, please visit thehowofbusiness.com. Take that next step today towards finally realizing your business ownership dreams. I look forward to having you join me for my next workshop. All right, so I have a follow-up question on that, but before that, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I'm glad you, you shared this because I, I speak to this point often, Amy, on my show um, and I think what, what can happen sometimes and see if you agree is that we can hide behind, oh, no, no, once I have the logo perfected, or as you mentioned, you know, once I've got the website perfect, then I'll start. And so we keep coming up with really logical excuses not to get launched. It's really that fear of rejection, maybe, but not to go that side way. But but I, I just about any business and certainly a consulting business, that's one of the things I love about consulting businesses that it allows you to start very small as far as the investment that you have to make, right? It it really doesn't require anything. But here's what it does require. And I want to get your thoughts on this because yeah, I can land that first project, but my fear is, do I quit my job now where I am making six figures just on having landed one project? How do I overcome that fear? That's a tough one. And I have a couple different answers because I see it happen with the people that I, I now serve in Billable at the Beach different ways. I will tell you the hardest thing, the hardest path to consulting is where you are sitting there in a six-figure job. It's really hard to let that go and take that leap. And so I think the people that are coming from the six-figure, there is going to be a leap. At some point, you are going to have to leap out, you know, off the high dive or out of the airplane with your, your parachute or whatever it is. At the same time, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of approaching everything in baby steps so that you don't get overwhelmed. 
there is, there's no way to avoid a certain amount of leap if you're sitting there in a six figure job. Right. And, I and, don't and know it's what... hard to do this as a side hustle, right? Because that's, that's almost impossible to do. Not impossible, but it's hard to do, isn't it? It's really hard to do in, in my world of consulting. It's really hard to do it as a side hustle for two key reasons. One is if you're sitting in a full-time corporate job you typically don't have a lot of extra time. Right. And the other is the potential for conflict of interest. Absolutely. Whether perceived or real, there's going to be a conflict. Yes. So if I'm working at a medical device company as a full-time employee, it's going to be very difficult for me to consult for other medical device companies. Of course, of course. So it's hard. And so Henry, I don't know what it, what you see with your. Yeah, no, what, 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 here's what I'm hearing, Amy. I think it goes back to, maybe we were discussing this be well, at the beginning about the money. I think that the money then comes into play and in having enough reserves or some other income stream, spouse, whatever, to yeah. carry the household for a period of time to give me enough runway to get this business built. That's that's the way I would approach it. What are your thoughts there? Well, the other thing is, and you can tell me if you see this in your other followers, um, life-changing events happen more than we would like. Correct. So people lose their jobs frequently these days. It's no longer on a, a reflection of poor performance. That's right. There are layoffs and bankruptcies and a lot of reasons why you might lose your job. There are life events. A spouse needs to take a job somewhere else. Um, a parent is ill. You know, some other catalyst that mm -hmm. really pushes you over that edge. Yeah, I love that. That's the exact word that came to my mind. So leverage, take advantage of those catalysts, those life-changing opportunities, and maybe that's the jumping off point, yeah? That honestly, that's what I see just because taking that big leap is hard. It's hard. Yeah. And we're not seeing that many people anymore spending 10 or 15 years at one company. Right. So these, these job ending things are much more common. And each one of those inflection points gives us the opportunity. So those of you who are listening now, congratulations, because you're by listening to this podcast and all of the episodes you're accumulating this kind of internal catalog of ideas so that when you reach one of those inflection points, you can say, aha, I have 10 ideas. These are my top three. Now's the time. Let's agreed. do it. Yep. Agreed. Well said. All right. Uh, what other one secret comes to mind to help me with that of generating revenue quickly after, after that first project? What, what other thoughts do you have there? Yes. So over all the years, and, and I've talked about how, you know, I was an engineer, so I didn't start at this from being what I call a sales animal. So over the years, I developed and eventually realized I was teaching what I call my three action steps to generate revenue now. And it's three simple steps that anyone can do that gives you the best possible chance of landing a project and putting a check in the bank. And you can do these. And, and we've talked about, you know, how do you make that loop? Even though I think it's hard to do it in parallel, it is possible to kind of stick a toe in the water by following these three steps. Okay. So the first one is define your value proposition. For those of you who aren't familiar with that term, it's sort of, sort of a fancy business school word for your elevator pitch or for me, your superpower. So figure out what is that superpower? What's your service offering going to be as a consultant? And I talked about that intersection of what you're really good at, have a lot of experience in, what lights you up. And you can never overlook it has to be something that someone will pay you for right. as a consultant. So you can't ever overlook that piece. Then I want you to make a list of people that you're going to tell. And because I identify, you know, part of, part of me is a very strong engineer that really loves to just 
hide out in my cubicle and turn out all the lights and have nobody bother me for a few days. Oh, I love that. Um, those folks find this step daunting. I want you to make a list of people you know. Everyone, even my most introverted engineers, can come up with at least 100 people. Yeah, that so sphere of influence, people that I'm going to let know, right? But exactly. Amy, and I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you on this, are, I'm only creating that list. Do am I, am I letting those people know while I still have a job or after I've started my business? I think this is the transition into. So yeah. if it's if you might be in a conflict of interest situation, right. you need to be mindful of that. Got to be very careful. Yeah. Okay. Everybody Fair else, everybody else can dive in full steam ahead. Yeah. So Got conflict it. of interest aside. Right. Conflict of interest aside. The other thing I love about this, Amy, is that it's kind of a way of putting a public stake in the ground. We, we, we've we kind of put it out there now. So uh, I think it helps us stay accountable to following through. What do you think? I agree. And it's, it's I'm, I'm realizing when you say that, that you just stated exactly why some of the people that I present this to are a little bit reluctant. You just hit the nail on the head with that, Henry. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's All right. because now it's kind of forcing that accountability. It's forcing that accountability. Yeah. All right. Number three is. Number three is tell everyone. So what's, what do you, what is, what's your service offering? Who are you going to tell and tell everyone? And it's that sphere of influence that, that we're talking about in the everyone. Um, and what this does, Henry, is this is hot lead generation. The hardest thing to do in lead generation is to generate hot leads. So these are people who already know you to some degree, and they know that you do great work because all of you do great work. I do great work. So do all of you. They already know you. They do great work. And what you're also looking for is someone who has a project that's appropriate for your skills and the budget to pay for it, because yeah. I don't want any of you working for free. Right, right. So I've been doing this so long. This has made up the foundation of my business development program for more than 15 years. I do this once a quarter and I've taught it thousands of times through my programs, my speaking, all the stuff out of every hundred people. And if you do more than a hundred, great. Out of every hundred, odds are you will hear back from three to five people who will say, you know what, Henry, let's talk. I think I might have a project for you. Out of those three to five, odds of closing one or two of those projects is very high. Very high. It's amazing how that can be a source of leads. And I'm so glad you highlighted, Amy. And this applies to any business. It always it amazes me when I ask people, I right, tell me about how you're getting the word out. And immediately people go to, oh, I'm going to run some Google ads and I've got the website and we're going to run an ad here and all this stuff is great. But then you ask them, have you let everybody you know, have you told them we're open for business? And they're like, no. And, and do, you, do you think it's, it goes back to that hesitancy of, uh, I don't know, maybe they're fear. embarrassed or what would it fear? Yeah. Fear of it's the fear. rejection. Is that what it is? Yeah. It's I'm not a mindset coach, but fear is always the biggest block. And here's Agreed. what it is. I'm afraid that I'm going to offer this to you and you're going to laugh at me. Yeah. You're going to reject it. Reject. Yes. I, I mean, we're human beings. I think we're all afraid of that. And even my, my guys in my program who've been selling millions and millions of dollars worth of technology products. Now I tell them they need to sell themselves and it's like they're in, in middle school again. Yeah. But it's very different because I, when, when my product that somebody else makes is rejected, it's easier for me not to take it personally, but now exactly. here it's me, it's my work. It's my knowledge. It's my expertise that you might reject. That's personal. And it is personal. I have, you know, I do email mar I do email marketing on top of all this other stuff eventually. And I would have somebody unsubscribe. And sometimes it, <laughs> a lot of times it would be someone that I know. Right. It still bothers me, Amy. It still bothers me. I have to be honest but, with you. 
I'm, I'm so happy to hear that, but here's the thing. And I would tell myself, you know, it's business. Don't take it personally. And then I thought, you know what? I have put my blood, sweat, and tears into this business. And when you unsubscribe, it it's okay to take it personally. It's personal, yeah. right, agreed. Henry? Agreed. 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 <laughs> you move <laughs> on. You realize that, that it doesn't it doesn't mean much more than that. But yeah, it's okay. No, to think it personally. it's okay. Because to otherwise, to it would tell alone. me you don't have a personal investment in what you're doing, right? Yes. It means you don't have a level of pride in what you're yes. doing. Yes. It and means that's, you, that's you can. Wrong. You can still talk to that person. That's right. It's okay. <laughs> Give it a few minutes. All right. Here's my my uh, my final question, and then we'll get into more about your, the program that you've been uh, speaking to, and also a great free download that people need to take advantage of. But the challenge I have found, and now I've started my business, it's successful. It's growing a consulting business that often is so challenging, going beyond myself to now having other consultants and staff. So. We we could talk about that for hours, but but at a high level, what what here's the question I want to ask: Is there is there a, a kind of a best practice or a measure that you look for that tells me I'm ready to bring on now another consultant onto my team? So I think the most important thing to really dig deep in on this is what do you want? What do you want your life to look like? And what do you want your business to look like? Because Henry, I have made the decision not to do that. Okay. But let's so, say that I have, I want to grow this business beyond what yes. I can, what I, because at the end of the day, the challenge with consulting is it is a form nonetheless, well, it's fine of trading hours for dollars, right? To some Completely. extent, I only have so many hours and that might be fine for me, or it may not be, Right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So I do have lots of colleagues. I have found a different path to productizing and moving beyond once you hit that ceiling of just selling your own. Okay. Time. So that's a great so, way to put it, productizing it. Yeah. Yes. So it's really important that, that you have enough of a solid pipeline. I think the pipeline is the most important thing to bringing other people on. And I do have a lot of consulting colleagues who bring other people on. Most of them don't bring other people on as employees. Right. They bring them on as kind of subcontract consultants. And I have in my career often worked as a subcontract consultant, but I'm going to make an important point about my criteria for working as a subcontractor. I will work as a subcontractor, but I will never discount my rate. Got it. So if they can pay my full rate and resell a markup on top of me, then I'm happy to have them do that. That makes sense. So most of the people I have on a handful of occasions had subcontract resources for very specific tasks that made sense. Sure. Otherwise I haven't generally, but what most of my colleagues do who do that, they don't bring on consultant employees Although you certainly can, you can just imagine that that extends the amount of overhead and commitment and and burden, honestly, on, on you as the founder to support all of that. What people are more likely to do is assemble what I call a large stable of all of the different types of resources and people that they might know to staff a certain function. Yeah, or a particular so project, may- yeah. You need to make sure that you don't have only one racehorse in the shoot. You need to have a few because your number one choice might not be available because you're not keeping them busy full time. Yeah. So the onus really comes on you to develop this stable of people, understand their experience and expertise, have a good relationship so that when you reach out to them, they want to work with you on their projects. So it really is a really big um, layer of complication. And what that means for the most part is if you're going to take that step, you're going to step up your revenue, but you're probably going to be much, you're going to be in the role of selling and closing the business and operating the company, probably not doing or doing far less that hands-on billable work. That's right. That's right. Okay. Great insights. Thanks for, thanks for those thoughts. All right. Tell me briefly a little bit more about the program that you've been referring to and also 
the download that you have, which I think expands on what we talked about for generating yes. those three action steps. So tell us more about that. Yes, yes. So really quickly how I started Bill at the Beach. And at this point now I'm completely focused on Bill at the Beach and not doing hands-on consulting anymore. Um, as I start built my consulting business, I would often have colleagues who would reach out to me and they would say, you know, you see, it seems like this is going great. It, this looks good. You know, can we have lunch and talk about it? <laughs> and that happened over and over. Mm -hmm. So at my core, I'm a very practical person. So I would think, well, okay, what do I want to tell them? What do I love? What do I hate? What do I wish I would have known? What would I do differently? And I started to accumulate a body of material. At the same time, I realized the market was really asking for what Billable at the Beach now is, a program to help people start their own independent consulting business. So it's really everything from A to Z, everything that you would need to know, but the focus is very practical. Revenue first, always. Land a project, get a check in the bank, and then are there all those other things? Name your business, build a website, corporate structure, all that stuff, tax, yes. But the first thing, land a project, get a check in the bank, get the revenue coming in, and answering all of those questions. Yeah. And every everybody comes at it with a slightly different set of experience. You talked a lot about, and it's so interesting because so many of the things that I tell my people came out of your mouth today. <laughs> <laughs> so we're definitely on the same track on a lot of this stuff. Part of what I do, I call it boot in the backside, is preventing people from hiding out Okay. You know, perfecting all their stuff before they go out and sell. Sure. One one of my superpowers is giving people steps that work specifically for them that they're able to take. So getting rid of the well, overwhelm and seeing. So the program consists of an online uh, piece on one of the online learning platforms. So there's a whole series of 14 modules, 50 videos, templates, you know, all the tools and all the stuff that you can do on your own schedule. It also includes um, group coaching where we come together every other week and we dig into each person's specifics. Okay, where are you? Oh, I need help on this proposal or, you know, I'm really good at figuring out where people are stuck and getting them unstuck. And then we hear other people talking about what their problems and issues are. So it actually is a place where having more than one person involved helps all of us, including I learn stuff every single time we have sure, one of our yeah. calls. Yeah, I'm sure. And then there's an online community where you may really need the answer to that proposal question because you want to present it on Friday you may not be able to wait two weeks for the next group call. That's where we can all access each other sort of, you know, 24 seven, get okay. answer each other's questions and dive in with that help. All right. So tell me the website to go to, to learn more about the program and to get the free download. Where do we go yes. for that? Billable at the beach.com. And the free download is I have a free email course that dives deeper into those three action steps to generate revenue now that we talked about. Got it. So got I it. have my my paid program and my book, but come on over to billableatthebeach.com because there's a ton of free resources there too. Absolutely. So the book again is Land a Consulting Project Now, Build a Life of Freedom, Flexibility, and Inspiring Work Running Your Own Six-Figure Business, specifically we've been talking about a consulting business. All right, we'll wrap it up, Amy. We could keep talking about this for hours, but what's one thing you want us to take away from the conversation we had about starting a consulting business? It might be some of the things you just articulated, but what what's a key takeaway if I'm thinking about starting a consulting business? Yes, there is nothing special about me. If I can do it, you can do it. So all of you, if you want to do this, you have what it takes. You have to do the work, but you have what it takes to take your corporate experience, your expertise, your career, and really live the life that you dream of. 
Well said. And I think that in addition to that, you know, what you've shared and your approach to just do it, just get started with it instead of hiding behind needing all of these different things. We just got to land that first client, get that first check in the bank. I love how you explained that. Tell us again where you want us to go online to learn more again and to sign up for the, the free course. Sure. It's billableatthebeach.com. My name is Amy Rasdell. So if you search on, if you just type in billable at the or billable and beach, you'll find me. <laughs> and as far as social media, my main place where I hang out with all the corporate types is LinkedIn. And the name, just curiously, billable at the beach. Obviously, you live in San Diego. Um, I love the. I think is the connotation of what what the flexibility that having our own business allows us. And for you, being near the beach is a big thing. Is that where the name inspiration comes from? Exactly. Freedom and flexibility. So my beach might be your mountain or your fishing boat or your golf course. Well said. Well said. Amy, great conversation. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for giving us practical advice and tips and for taking the time with me to be with me today. Thank you so much for having me, Henry. This is Henry Lopez, and thanks for joining me on this episode of The How of Business. My guest today again was Amy Rasdahl. I release new episodes every Monday morning. You can find the show anywhere you listen to podcasts, including at my website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.